All right, attention nerds. <laughs> Looks like I've been unmuted, so that means it's time for us to start. I hope everyone's doing all right out there. Welcome to our Wednesday Zoom chat, uh, except it might be Thursday if you're in Australia. Um, <laughs> right. uh, we've been doing these every Wednesday here at the Writers Guild Foundation, talking to writers about writing. I know it's usually the high point of my week, and I know it is for a lot of you out there too, and we appreciate you joining us. Uh, today we're here with Tony McNamara, co-writer of The Favorite and creator, showrunner, and executive producer of the new Hulu series, The Great, based on his play of the same name about Catherine the Great. Um, it premieres May 15th on Hulu. I got a chance to watch some of it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> if this were an auditorium, you all would be on the floor right now. Um, <laughs> And we're also joined by Davi Waller, formerly a writer-producer on shows like Mad Men and Halt and Catch Fire. And now she's the creator, showrunner, and executive producer of FX on Hulu series, Mrs. America, which I don't know about y'all, but it's been one of my obsessions getting me through quarantine. So Tony, Davi, we are so excited that you're here. And on behalf of everybody in the Zoom, I'm gonna give you a massive round of applause and a big huzzah. <laughs> We're excited to be here, virtually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very nice to be here. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Yeah, of course. Um, so just a little clarification about how this is going to work. Um, everybody except for the three of us is muted, um, but people can submit pertinent questions via the chat box, and my colleagues are monitoring that. And if they see questions that they think are relevant, they'll text them to my attention, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and we're also recording this too for anybody who's out there. If you miss anything, it should be up on the WGF website at the end of the week. Um, and before we dive into anything else, I just want to preface for everybody. This is a conversation about research uh, and the role it plays in developing and writing films and TV series. Um, so to start everything off, I'll uh, tell everyone about me. I'm a librarian slash archivist at the Writers Guild Foundation. We have a library of 45,000 films and TV scripts and an archive of writers' papers and other collections that document the history of the WGA West. Um, and we work to serve writers. When there's not a pandemic going on, um, people can come in and read scripts and learn the craft. And um, the idea of having conversations about research methods was born from our realizing that film and TV writers have very specific research needs. And while we talk ad nauseum about the writing process, the process of finding, gathering, and implementing information into our writing is a little more shrouded in mystery and we don't talk about it as much. Um, so, um, since Tony and Davi have projects that are based on history and real events and people, uh, I'm going to ask some specific questions aimed at revealing and shining a light on that research process. And hopefully this will give you some ideas about how to enrich your own projects with research. Um, but enough of me giving context. Let's dive right in. <laughs> um, so having watched both your shows, it seems like you might have um, slightly different approaches to research, which is why I'm excited to talk to both of you at once. <laughs> um, and as kind of a baseline question, did you have an interest in or knowledge of your respective show subjects before you started writing them? Like why, and why were, uh, you know, Catherine the Great or Phyllis Schlafly and the women's liberation movement initially enticing to you? I'll let Tony go first because he's got a cool chalkboard behind him and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know anything. Well, that's not true. I, I think what sort of helped me want to make the show was I knew almost nothing about Catherine the Great except maybe she banged a horse. And then I found out like, oh, and also was a woman, young woman who went and took over an empire and sort of kept the enlightenment alive and started women's education and science and um, invented the roller coaster. And um, so I thought, well, she seemed like a fascinating character. And at the same time, I was interested in the idea her life had been reduced to this salacious headline. So that, that was sort of the, two elements that made me sort of interested in writing the show. Cool. 
Um, so I, I was always interested in women's studies. I took a women's studies class uh, in college, which is when I first heard of Phyllis Schlafly. And I'm, you know, I'm a huge political junkie. I was looking to write about politics and particularly something centered on women in politics. I just hadn't seen enough women in, in political dramas. So I thought um, the women's movement in the 70s and particularly through the eyes of the leader of the backlash just felt like a really enticing subject area. For sure. Um, so let's, let's start at the beginning of the process. So Tony, you know you're adapting your play about Catherine the Great into a series. And Davi, you've just agreed to create the series about Phyllis Schlafly and the ERA. As far as research is concerned, where do you start? Um, well, I think because I'd done some research for the play, but it would be, had been a long time ago. And I knew I wasn't, I, I, like for me, the show's not a history lesson. Um, and that was the thing in the room, you know, I was like, it's not a history lesson. There are certain points in her life I'm interested in hitting. There's an essence of her I'm interested in showing. But even on the title card on the show, it says the great and occasionally true story. Right. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's right up front where like, we're not really doing, in the same was like that with a favorite. Yorgos used to say, it's not a history lesson. Whenever he was questioned by, studios or whatever he was like we're doing our own thing and um and it's sort of loosely based so um so i knew a lot and then but i'd forgotten it since the play because the play had been a while ago and then i decided that might be an advantage to have forgotten it mm -hmm. um and then once we got a room together there some of the younger writers went off and of course you know being good people they went and researched to know about the show so I sort of was in a good position where a lot of people in the room knew a lot and I decided I didn't need to know much I knew needed to know things as they helped my story um and so that's sort of um so how I did it was like some people knew a lot in the room and some people didn't know anything and because of the nature of the story and how I wanted to tell it that was kind of a felt like a good way to go for us you know that we could hit dip into history where we needed it and there were things you know i really knew i wanted to tell that were important about her but there was also you know we created characters that didn't exist you know lots of them um so there was sort of that so it was sort of a uh, we sort of interfaced with history in a sort of loose way or organic way i suppose mm -hmm. I definitely second what Tony was saying that, you know, these are TV shows, they're not history lessons. I always bristle when someone's like, it's such an important show. I'm like, no, it's a TV show. <laughs> Don't put that on me to make it important on top of entertaining. Um, but I found for me, especially because the scope of what I was looking at was, you know, an eight year, 10 year battle, a huge ensemble of characters that for me, research was a starting point. So, we, all the story, all the character came out of the research because I really didn't know much about this time period. And also I wanted to interpret this story my own way and my own spin on it. So I didn't want to just like watch a documentary about women's movement and say, okay, I guess that's Gloria Steinem and I'll just like write her from there. I wanted to go directly to primary sources and read Gloria in her own words and read Phyllis in her own words and find where's the human drama. But for me, that comes from immersing myself in all the materials I could get my hands on. For sure. So, so that being said, um, how do you um, go about finding resources? I know uh, Kate Blanchett mentioned on Vanity Fair's Still Watching podcast that the Eagle Forum has a robust archive. <laughs> oh my God. I, I mean, if you need a good archivist, get the people from the Eagle Forum. There is not one TV appearance that Phyllis was in that's not on their website. <laughs> We're like, where do they find this stuff? Um, so they catalog everything. Um, so I, it's really a mixture because, you know, this wasn't, there was no IP. There's not like one book that this was adapted from. So it was multiple sources. So I, you start with the basics, which is you read all the biographies that were written about these women. Um, there are like two biographies of Phil Schlafly, a bunch of biographies about Gloria Steinem and, and all the way down the road. And then you also want to read their own writing. So, you know, these women were so prolific too prolific. They each wrote like a bunch of memoirs. <laughs> right. 
Like, how about just one memoir per woman, okay? Like, not three. We don't need three memoirs. She read all her memoirs. And then I, I, I went and read all the local newspapers, national newspapers from the 1970s. So I really, once you've, re you've read what other people write about them, you want to go and read directly from them, not 30 years after the fact. They're telling you how they remember that time. You want to read what they said about themselves and the movement and this period of time in the 1970s. So for that, I became a, you know, year-long subscriber to newspapers and I would just look up every interview ever done with all these women. And I found that super, super helpful. Uh, what about you, Tony? What, uh, what initial, like, resources did you find yourself consulting? I think similar, like, she wrote a diary for, um, a long period of her life so there was we had that and um and i think just the same i mean you know biographies i mean we did a lot of research as well um we did a lot of research sort of almost as much about the period um in europe and about the details of like dumb, dumb details where you just go what was contraception then well how did they do a pregnancy test you know and and you know they would always be because they were fascinating and weird and much weirder than we could make up. We would go, oh, it could be hilarious if it was this. And then it was always better what they actually did because it was so bizarre. Um, so we sort of had that. We had a board with like dumb shit from 1780. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, we, I mean, I know that um, there were certain writers who got bits, you know, they went off and, did a lot of research about like the actual coup moment, which, you know, we didn't get to, but, you know, we knew, so we would know sort of around the, around the tentpole things I wanted to do, uh, people would go off and, you know, one person would go off and study the whole thing. I think as a what in, you know, read whatever they needed to read to be fully in it. And that could be, you know, and we had really good research writers who, you know, were sort of, um, you know, had studied history. So they really knew how to research and go to primary sources and strange lateral ways of looking at it. Um, and we kept, I kept it sort of like, not everyone would do that. So that other people were just receiving it as writers, like, you know, writers writing a show that wasn't a documentary, much more like, okay, all of that's what happened. How do we filter that through the show, you know? Right. Um, and, you know, and I suppose we're in a position where, no one in no one in the show is alive anymore. So you know, we're, we're, we we had a little more freedom than maybe Darby had. You know, to kind of we weren't so worried about oh we're really being harsh about all the or uh, well, the bit rough on the bit rough on the priesthood. You know, so we you know we're a little looser with that. So I have sort of a follow up question. Um, did you find yourself consulting? You know, like ex or in your case, Davi, like people who were there? And how do, you, how do you approach those people and how do you get them to talk to you? And what do you find yourself asking them? Well, first I'm like, hey dad, remember in 1970? <laughs> <laughs> the convention? <laughs> he was my free consultant. He's a political scientist. Um, but beyond that, I, um, I, on my writing staff, I hired a writer who now she, she predominantly mostly writes mystery novels but she was a TV writer in the 70s. She actually ran Cagney, the original Cagney and Lacey. So mm -hmm. I hired her part as a consultant to be in our writer's room. She lived through the period and that was a really wonderful uh, perspective to have in the writer's room itself. And then um, we also hired as a consultant, the biographer of Phyllis Schlafly, Carol Felsenthal, who had spent time with Phyllis and her family at her home uh, in the 70s. So not only did I read her book, but then just she talked to our writer's room. And then we would kind of pull in experts as needed. So for instance, there's an episode called Jill in the middle of the series that's about the 1976 Republican convention and the, the move, sort of the, the hijacking of the Republican Party. And so um, I talked to an expert in political history of that time period and then we, he, came, you know, he talked to our writer. So we'd pull in as needed when we needed to ask specific questions that we weren't able to find in the research. Got it. Tony, did yeah, you I think we, yeah, yeah, we had, I mean, we had a, we did hire a historian, a, like a, a consultant historian who just gave us a big overview of the whole thing. And they can be, um, we did on the favorite too, that we would just had, cause they pointed out to us the thousand things we got wrong. Um, <laughs> so that was, that was helpful. Um, but we also, it was also good for us to know all that and have a bedrock 
this is it's in a simple form this is how it all laid out i guess um and also because we were knowingly getting it wrong we had this thing where it had to be really obvious we were choosing to get it wrong and we weren't just fucking idiots interesting um, yeah so that you know so that when we made mistakes it felt like it wasn't a mistake it was a choice and you know that kind of thing got it um so i'm going to kind of like shift gears here um and ask what as you're kind of going through this what comes first writing or research or is it kind of you know you're saying you're pulling from experts as needed is are you you know writing and researching at the same time what's what's the interplay there I think for us, it was a lot of it was at the same time. I think once we had, cause I had the play, which gave me the basics. And then we would really like go off the story we were creating. And then sometimes we would go to, oh, what really happened around the smallpox epidemic? And what did the church think? And who ran science and who ran medicine? And, you know, we would go and find that out and that would feed into the story. Um, in quite an organic way, I think. And also we, because Catherine was, you know, the show has a contemporary feel, we were also had research about contemporary activism. So mm. we were sort of had two different boards going. One was like, you know, that time in Russia, but we also had, you know, um, contemporary activism and what that is and how you change the world and what the history of activism was. And so that became like a thing as well about how people change. And so we had sort of, we did a lot of research on contemporary activism and how that worked and um, examples. And we used some of that. So both those things would feed into the storytelling, you know. Um, I, I, likewise, I would say the research and the storytelling is happening concurrently and sometimes you want to tell a specific story and you go into the research saying, please, please back me up on this. <laughs> and sometimes history is cruel and you can't tell the story you want to tell and you're like, fuck it. And then other times you're reading the research, like a perfect example, the opening image of um, the pilot came out of research. Like I was like, what's a great way to introduce Phyllis to audiences? And I read this, I started noticing maybe these little blurbs about Republican party leaders, the women would throw fashion shows and tea parties and the wives of governors and senators would parade around to raise money. And I'm like, that, I would <laughs> never knew that was happening, but also what a great opening image. So I think it, it, it's like chicken and egg. Sometimes one begets the yeah. other. I, was, I there, think that's totally true. was there anything that you really, really wanted to do in your shows that, that was killed when you found out that it, you know, something like that never would have happened or I think the car chase in the finale. That was <laughs> no. uh, there was, it wasn't really for us. I mean, there were certain things there where we wouldn't bend history on purpose. You know, there were times we did it and there were times it just felt untrue enough that it felt wrong to her to kind of like, because there was sort of an, the, base, the baseline for us because we were a little loose was the character and being true to what we felt was the essence of her. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if we had a cool idea, if the history didn't back us up, but also it didn't feel like she would back us up, then we didn't do it, you know. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things um, the writers and I were, were disappointed in the history that um, after Shirley Chisholm's run for president, she retreated um, in politics and, you know, and so, we weren't able to continue her story in the, our political story through the later episodes. Um, there's one there's a big episode that takes place at a women's convention in 1977 and all the feminist leaders were there and not surely she ended up getting remarried that weekend. And that really killed us because you want to have her throughout the entire series, but then, you know, that's not what the story is. Hopefully someone will do a movie of Shirley Chisholm and tell her full story because we only told one little tiny piece of it. Right. Yeah, someone please, someone please do that if you're yes. out there. Hello, one of you guys. Yeah. I've got all research materials. I'm happy to give it to you. <laughs> um, so on sort of a, this is kind of a related question, um, but how do you start to build a structure from facts and information? Like both these shows for different reasons feel painfully like they're about right now. Um, so say, say that you're Arthur Miller and you're writing The Crucible, 
do you go in knowing that you're telling a story about McCarthyism or do you sort of like discover that as you go along? First of all, I wish I had written The Crucible. <laughs> so I'd like to imagine a Martha Miller for a second. Yeah, totally. Um. Like how much do you know the theme, kind of, you know, the themes that you're, that you're looking to explore like right from the outset and how much of that kind of bubbles up? I think you do, I think you do know. In fact, I would say if I created the series 10 years from now, I would tell a different story of that same time period because mm -hmm. I would choose to find what are the stories that do feel re relevant and resonate today. So, mm -hmm. and what was interesting in This America was I sold it to FX back in like late 2015 before the 2016 election. So I actually thought it was going to be about very different themes, you know, the irony of, you know, writing about one of the most famous anti-feminists when you have a female president, <laughs> you know, and um, that's hilarious. So, and then 20, I was writing the draft of the pilot during the 2016 election and suddenly had to recalibrate and say, well, actually there's something else I want to say with this series that I didn't know about when I, when I sold it back in 2015. That's so interesting. Yeah, I think both. I think you, I, like, I went in knowing themes, but I think you are in your own time. So even though it's a historic history show, there's something contemporary about it because that's how we wanted to do it. But it was also like, I think themes come up because you're a writer and you're reflecting where you are. And so, and I think it's true, you get accidental zeitgeist where you pitch something three years ago and you know, it suddenly feels like, oh, this empire run by a maniac who's violent and crazy and doesn't really give a fuck about his people. I, I don't know. That seems, you know, <laughs> you know but, but at the time you don't think of any of that, you know, but in, once you're writing it and you've got writers in the room and if you're making a show that like both our shows are very political in a way, you know, then people are, that's part of everyone's DNA and that's the fights you have in the room and that's the, so you start to engage and different themes start to emerge, I think. Totally. Um, were there any, um, you know, in terms of like developing your shows, were there any other like plays or movies or TV shows that you look to for inspiration? Or that, you know, the writers in your room would, would reference a lot? Yeah, we, I mean, we had a board where people would put uh, things up, but they were really like, um, they were quite random. So sometimes I would look <laughs> at it going, someone should be fired. Whoever wrote that, <laughs> well, you know, that fucking World War II movie, what's going on? But, you know, there would be things like MASH and Amadeus and, you know, Catch-22. And so we had like, you know, Hal Ashby movie. There was all sorts of stuff that sometimes I looked at it and thought, well, clearly no one knows what the show is. <laughs> But other times it was, <laughs> including me, and other times it was really useful because we would be like, it's definitely like that. And, you know, so. I think for me, for inspiration, I definitely went back to rewatch my favorite films from the 70s, you know, especially the political dramas like The Candidate, All the President's Men, Nashville, The Conversation. I was watching Mary Tyler Moore show, which ended up in the, one of the episodes. Also, think, that, that's my favorite episode of Mary Tyler Moore. Ah, <laughs> I, I was like, yes, that's the best joke ever. <laughs> like, first of all, Mary Tyler Moore was so funny and ahead of its time. Rhoda was doing yoga and it was only like 1970. Yeah. Um, so I think just wanting to get a feel for like, how are people, talk, some of those favorite movies that, of mine from that time period, because like, how did they speak? How did they talk? What was the language? What was the visual style? Um, to avoid kind of falling into writing cliches about the time period, but actually writing, you know, and I actually wish I had seen, I just saw this movie recently, Three Women, which is a Robert mm -hmm. Altman film mm -hmm. in the 70s. I wish I had seen it when we were writing the show because there's this great dinner party scene and I'm like, oh my God, that food. I would have put all that food in the, <laughs> the specificity of 1970s dinner party food. Yeah. Pigs um. So you guys kind of touched on this um, a little bit earlier, but um, I want to I want to go back to working with um, like historical consultants, and I'm I'm interested in um, the kind of things that you were asking of them, and how how you liked to have um, information presented to you, or how how do you like to have you know when someone's coming at you with all this research they've done, how do you like how do you like to take that in? <laughs> Um, I think that's why it's good to have writers with some kind of research background to me, 
like we had one or two writers in the room who knew how to research from their school days, I guess. And and so what was good about that, because often with this just historic consultant historians, it's really needle in a haystack and they don't uh, have story instincts in a way of mm -hmm. what we'll be doing. Whereas often a writer who can research, they're the gold because they also have story instincts. So right. they end up, pre they present things to you that they know will make good story. And so they, that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for everything. They're looking for what's going to help us, what's story, what's drama. Um, and, and, you know, so to me, whenever, you know, the one or two of our room who could do that were great because they would come in and they, they had read thousands of pages, but they could boil it down to me in like an hour or two of just talking through various aspects. And also you could very much be very specific about sending people away with what you were looking for and they would know what that was and how that worked as, as story, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think it's what Tony's saying. And I would, I would agree with that, that a historical consultant is of limited usefulness because of the story instinct issue that you raise. And I, you know, I major in history, so I'm not afraid of, of some primary sources myself. And um, so I definitely was one of the nerds in the room, but I also, when I was hiring my writing staff, you know, one of our writers, Sharon Hoffman, sat down with me and she's like, hey, look, research is my jam. I'm like, you're hired. You know, like you definitely yeah. want a couple of people in the room who are not afraid of research. And then the other thing that was so helpful is I asked the studio to hire a researcher for me. who's like an aspiring writer, researcher, and he also had great story instincts and he was way more, he even like, he took one for the team and he actually became a member of the Eagle Forum for us. <laughs> very, very, very dangerous. Um, so he was like on the inside. Um, so there, so that was really helpful. I would say have the studio pay for a researcher. It's not very expensive and having a researcher in the room, you can be like, can you find out this one specific thing? Or, you know, I need, what are, what are the top five Broadway shows at that time? You know. Was right, right. valuable not just in breaking story but also on draft. You know, I'd have like just endless questions as I'm, fi you know, filling in like to make you know those specific historical references um, was really really helpful. Um, but it, I think what Tony was saying is not just knowing the history; you have to have story instincts. And so often when we're talking to historical consultants, we have very specific questions. So rather than tell us everything you know about 1976 Republican convention, we'd say here's the story we want to tell is really emotional. Does this line up with what you know of the history? And if not, like, correct us. So very guided questions are right. Um, and then uh, how do you, like, in overall, how, how are you keeping track of everything? I mean, it's probably so much stuff. Like, how do you, like, how do you keep, like, literally keep tabs on what you want to use? Like, is it binders? Is it a wiki? Is it, like, is that someone's job in the writer's room? Like, who's, who's like, the keeper of everything that, um, that you're coming up with? <laughs> yeah, that's someone's, it's basically that's someone's job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had a Dropbox. Our, our researcher I had him put together a Dropbox, and it, it was, a reference is cataloged by episode and by person. So we'd have, you know, Phyllis. And then within Phyllis, you had articles that we're using for episode two, three, four, five, Betty, all the way down. And then by episode, you had all the research materials that had to do with that episode story. So yeah. that was for master research. And then I also, I brought some props. For oh, you. yes. <laughs> so I had, mostly I read online everything and I would highlight on, um, but I did read a couple of hard copies, and you could see I had these little post-it notes with tabs, like, oh, this would be great for the scene in her apartment. With yeah. You, know, you kind of, like, make notes to yourself. But that's not, this is a bad system, because then when you're writing your script, you're like, which age was that? <laughs> but I did that for, for all the books as well, and that was, that was kind of a very archaic way of doing it. Um, so then... Um, if you're, you know, so once you have all your research, how do you, um, how are you sort of, once it's becoming a show, how are you disseminating that research to your, you know, co-writers, the production design team, actors, all of whom I assume are doing their own research? How, how are you sharing, like, how are you sharing and collaborating on that? And um, was there anything you started digging deeper into on the basis of somebody else's research 
Yeah, I mean, I think I production design and costume are obviously a big, I mean, big part of our show. So, I mean, they started off scripts, of course, mm -hmm. and then they went and did their own research. And because, um, you know, we were writing while we were in pre-pro, we were writing while we were in production as well. So they they were great because they would also feed back. You know, I said to them early on, I said, we don't know everything and, you know, we don't, you know, as writers, we've gone with story and character and all this stuff. But once we get the physical, once you're creating and we were building the palace in the studio. Um, so, so once they went and did their research on costume and they weren't being slavish, they were being like the show, slightly not right. Uh, but they also, you know, I was like, if you read a script and you know we're doing something and you think in your research you find something cool, just bring it back and we'll put it in. So they did that a little bit. They would find things um, in the research they did that they would come back and, like, they found out that costume and hair and makeup found out that they used to have tattoos on their faces, the women at balls. And they were made of black felt, but they would stick them. They had horses and crowns and they had this system of who was romantically available with hearts and where they put it. So they'd put all, you know, and they brought that back to us and we just went, yeah, they were, so we would use it. So it would, so there was a continual back and forth for us with production design and costume about storytelling that they would inform the scripts as well, which, which was fun for them and fun for us. Cause you know, they, their research, because they researched in a different way because they were so specific. Um, yeah. And even the costumes, just the, the fact that the women had to wear, and once the actresses had to put on those costumes, that became a thing. You know, we were like, well, that's a fucking nightmare. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's a nightmare for our actors trying to do it. So it must've been a nightmare then. So then we started to feed that a little bit into the script about how difficult that was. So there were things like that, I guess. One of the things I did in the writer's room that I thought was really successful was um, we had all the writers choose one person to go deeper on. So everyone got to, someone chose Flo Kennedy, someone chose Betty Friedan, someone chose Shirley Chisholm, and they took a week to really read all their writing, read everything, all the materials, and then present to the room, like, here's what I found. And we did the same thing for every year in the 70s. So everyone took a different year of the 70s and looked at all the pop culture and what was going on and then would present to the room so that we didn't all have to be doing all the research. And that also was really helpful because in assigning drafts to different writers because the writer had done all the research and on Betty Friedan and really fell in love with Betty Friedan was a natural choice to write a draft of the episode that featured Betty Friedan. Um, and then it were and then for the actors, we usually once we cast an actor, we sent them a research packet that was based on all the research materials we'd gathered to get them started. If there's a documentary, like for Uzo, we sent her the documentary on Shirley Chisholm, the two books she wrote, and then a, whole, a bunch of articles that we thought would be relevant. Um, and then they did their own research, but I think, you know, Tony's really right that the costume and hair, like I know Rose said, like it wasn't until she put on the Gloria wig and the aviators that she felt like Gloria. And I remember, you know, like that, that was really a big part of their process. And I know that Kate was very involved with Bina in terms of choosing the costume and what Phyllis would wear. And it really, all that all comes out of character um, as well. So it was, it was a really nice dialogue. And when you're lucky as we were to find such talented people, both our production designer, our costume designer, our hair and makeup, that they're as research intensive as you are and they're bringing as much as you are to it and their own ideas, like, that's just the you know, ideal situation. So interesting. Um, actually, uh, we've got an audience question. Um, how much how much detail found through research um, did you bring uh, to the pitch for your shows? Very little. <laughs> you want to get in and out of there very fast. If you're there more than 40 minutes, mm -hmm. everyone's bored. So I, you just want to tease it enough, I would say like three or four details that show them like this won't just be generic and broad, but um, you know, the yeah, I mean, keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, not many. I mean, we had a, I'd written the pilot, so they all knew the rough, what it was, but then there was just a few details you throw in that you think are enticing, but not too many. Right, right. <laughs> and really, 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 trying to get out fast. 
it's truly a tease. It's a tease. Yeah. <laughs> also, you really want to you want them to know that yes, this is a historical event, but it's not going to be a history lesson. So you really yeah. want to pitch them the arc of your characters and the emotional story you're going to be telling them, and not throw a bunch of facts at them because then they'll just be like, "Well, I'm so okay. bored." Let's yeah. Get yeah. Um, and then, did you um, did you have to write annotated drafts of your scripts? Um, and if so, let's let's uh, if yes, let's explain what those are uh, to the audience and kind of um, unpack that a little bit. <laughs> so there's this thing called a legal department at the studio. <laughs> They're very worried about getting sued, so they make you annotate your scripts with all your sources to make sure they don't get sued. And I personally did not annotate the scripts. But our amazing researcher did. <laughs> it was very painful. But it's it's kind of like it's like a term paper where you know something happens and there's like a footnote and it's like this is real, this is where we found it, or this is a dramatization, and this is why we're dramatizing this, this is why we think it's likely that this would have happened, blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, but just so everyone kind of understands that that's like a big part of writing um, historical true stories. Keep your receipts. That's my advice. <laughs> Keep all your receipts. <laughs> they're come, they're at the last for them. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to delve into now sort of using using research to write. Um, so how how do you go about making the world of the story accessible to other people? Like in both your shows, there's this hierarchy of who gets to assume power and everybody's role. And I guess what I'm asking is like how do you approach exposition? and laying down the rules for us, assuming that we as the viewers don't know much. Um, hmm. Great question. Because I actually don't like writing a lot of exposition. So I, I definitely challenge the <laughs> audience. I just assume they're gonna yeah. be stopping and Google searching and I don't have to explain yeah. anything. <laughs> <laughs> and um, hope that's what's happening. And also, um, lucky for us, and we spent hours in the writer's room wondering, how are we going to explain the ERA ratification process, this thing that's been dead for 40 years that's really not easy to understand that we don't even always understand? Right. Um, and then there was this resurgence of the ERA, and suddenly John Oliver was doing a 20-minute primer on it. So we were like, all right, John Oliver did a great exhibition <laughs> on the ERA. We'll just... Hope people have seen last week tonight. Um, right. <laughs> no, but I think I think what what I jo I'm joking about that. But um, I think what you're getting at is there's a way to there's a way to write historical to write about history in a way that feels modern and relatable. I mean, I think it's about you know I don't know how to explain it. Other than, like you don't want to be writing like you're watching it through this gauzy lace of 19th century and everyone's drinking with their tea you know tea with their pinkies in there. You want it to feel modern even though it's you know historically accurate and i think um finding what is relatable to us today and i think that was where all the character research really came into play like there's this one moment that i read about that gloria steinem is obviously a cultural icon and larger than life and seems like this like demigod that we can't possibly reach to she used to like late at night would go and like steal food and snacks from her you know employees <laughs> <laughs> yes, when she got hungry, and then she'd leave them little notes like, "Sorry, I took your pop tarts, Gloria. I'll return it." And I thought, "Oh, it's so like I just relate to that as someone who steals snacks all the time, and also that just makes her feel really human." And, and I could see someone doing that today. And so, like putting those moments in your script. Um, in terms of pipe, I think you just have to hope there's a character in the scene that's dumber than the audience, who they can explain it to. I guess <laughs> if, that, if you don't have that available, you know. Um, right. Yeah, I think that's, I think you have to create your sort of structure, like, from your characters. And that, so that's that you don't have to do exposition. They're just, the nature of your storytelling and the nature of your characters is revealing the structure of your world mm -hmm. without you having to stop and do it. So we would, you know, we would create story and we knew it was telling some of the structure of the world, but we were like, let's never stop and tell it, you know. Um, and I think especially to tell a modern style story, you kind of have to do that. And we were always, you know, even though we had the historical factor, we were always like, what's the contemporary version of this episode? And, it right. was, and we would always try and boil it down to like, uh, a young woman marries the wrong man and wakes up and thinks, should I kill him? 
and that was it you know so we would like be like that you know every episode i'd be like well what what's the contemporary version what's the 20 year old woman waking up in chicago what's her version of this story you know so we would try and do a bit of both but i do think the pipeline thing is particularly in historical drama can kill you dead you know i think you've really got to like work hard at making your characters and your the way you pick story and how to tell your story is is how you get around the fact historical drama can feel deathly at times I also find whenever we got a note back from the network, you know, this was confusing or we didn't understand, can you explain this? The to me, the real note behind the note is we're not following the emotion in the scene. And I think if you're telling a really emotional story and everyone's following the emotion of the scene and what each character wants and what the conflict is, the pipe doesn't really matter. Like it doesn't really matter if you know all the details of how the area is ratified. You understand that these women feel threatened and these women are advocating for change and that's what's happening. And it's not, so I always would ask, well, are you getting the emotion of the scene? And if you're not, that that's the problem. But it, the answer is never to lay more pipe, but it's definitely never. Right. <laughs> um, I, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into um, what you need in order to feel confident writing like a real life person, perhaps an iconic person. You talked a little bit about Gloria Steinem. Um, how do you, um, what, what are some additional ways you might try to find their voice and not feel stifled? Um, because I imagine that that's really intimidating, um, trying to, you know, present Gloria Steinem. Like. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> it's um. done though. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, like, we're, we're filling in, we're, we're imagining conversations that we were not privy to. Um, and I think, you know, you read, you read their diaries or their memoirs, you read how they write about themselves. And then you have to throw it away and just write, you know, it's going to be a mixture, ultimately, of your voice and theirs. It's never been. And ironically, whenever, often when we got a note back from the network, like, this doesn't sound like them, it was usually in a direct quote. So I, <laughs> so like, sometimes the actual direct quotes from the actual women didn't seem like the women <laughs> the people. So um, I think you have to, you have to take liberties. That's where the artistic license comes in. Um, but I will say that you still have to have, there are in their own writings, you'll find a lot of uh, keys to like the, by the language they use or the way, especially how they talk about themselves. That's what I'm always interested in reading their memoirs. Mm -hmm. I think you, you get a real sense of their, at least their psychology. And I think if you understand their psychology, it's easier to unlock how to write in their voice. Tony, anything to add? Uh, well, I didn't have any real, I mean, I guess because they're all dead, I didn't feel particularly the whole thing. Write about dead people, that is what I mean. Yeah, I mean, uh, listening to that, I mean, like, I'm just gonna write about dead people because I really don't want to annotate my scripts. Right, right. <laughs> Seriously, it seems very hard work. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, so how do you go about, um, similarly, uh, writing characters that are outside of your personal experience, um, outside your gender, outside your sexual identity, your, your ethnicity, maybe your political affiliation? Um, I mean, particularly with Mrs. America, I mean, there's characters that are literally all over the map. Um, what role does research play in writing characters that might be very different from you? I would actually say more I than know. I mean, I just think, sorry. I, no, I'm, I mean, I mean, I, as a writer, that's why I'm a writer. It's much more interesting to write people who are in, you know, it, it, it's sort of like, that's what's interesting about it. That's what's fun about it. It's like, they're not like me or they are versions of me or they're people like, so to me, that's what's interesting about it. I don't think the, I mean, the research of that didn't inform us that much or it's, you know, or it's, it's you're writing people far away from you. Like some people in the room found the emperor because he's a maniac, really hard to write. Yeah. Um, because they, in, in a way, that's a judgment thing. That's like writers judging the character and not just writing them from where they're coming from. Um, so I think, I think for me, it's like, that's why I write is it's like interesting all these different voices and what would that be? It's like being an act, you know, it's like an actor coming and finding what they want and why they want it and what's the logic. And 
yeah. so that uh, so you know I guess I come from that place with it all I would, I would also add to that that that's where having a writing staff is so valuable and even yeah. more so than the research by you know when you write alone you know and I think we can all write lots of different people outside of our experience but when you have a group of writers and you can get a yeah. different group of writers and we had writers from of all ages race sexual orientation Right. and gender in our room, you, that's what helps you because they're helping inform how you write about people who are outside your own experience. Totally. Yeah, I think that's true. That's really true. I, you know, and you staff your room with that in mind. Yeah. I, I mean, I do. I mean, I really, you know, Catherine's 22 years old and I'm nearly 22, but not quite. <laughs> so I was like, you know, so we had, you know, 23, you know, young writers who were 23, 24, and to test, you know, to talk about their experience and how that fed into the character, you know, so you do kind of go, you are sort of feeding your characters by who you staff with, you know, yeah. and you are picking people you feel like lock into certain characters more than others, or will have a different version of that character that you can sort of um, grapple with, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I want to dig a little bit deeper um, into kind of like experiential research um, where, you know, if the character you're writing experienced something that you weren't around to experience, be it the Seven Years War or the first National Women's Conference in Houston in 77, how do you go about finding those kind of like, what it, what it was like to literally be on that floor or in that war? How do you, how do you go about like finding those details? Or is that something you just kind of like cook up with your imagination or try to find parallels to right now? How do you go about that? I'm interested in what Tony has to say because you don't have footage from that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true. I think it's a mix of both. I mean, a mix of, because also we created the world to a lot, to some extent. It's a, We were a bit of a mix of both. Like we would go and find out what it was and then we would embellish or, you know, to serve our theme or our character or to push the, push the world a little harder. I mean, often those things were really interesting. Um, but I, yeah, so I guess you just imagine, try and imagine yourself and your character. I mean, your characters have a specific response to the world. So you just create what's the world and then you sort of feed them into it in a way, um, mm -hmm. I suppose. So yeah, I mean, we were free, you know, we were sort of free of that a little bit in that we could create what's the front look like or what's the, you know, back of the front or what's so we created things but there were also things that were true I guess mm -hmm. since, since we were doing the 70s we had footage which is you know both yeah. a blessing and a curse you know when you have the footage so you can't do something that you don't see in the footage but at the same time I think you do you just try to imagine yourself like you said in that situation and you find whatever experience you've had that feels you know parallel or similar to that particular situation. I also I also find like for the Democratic National Convention in 1972, there were so many different accounts. You know, Gary Hart wrote a book about it and Shirley Chisholm wrote about it and Nora Ephron wrote an amazing essay about it called Miami. So when you read like multiple, multiple accounts of the same event, you do see through lines. You do kind of get a sense of what it smelled like and seemed like, like all I kept reading was it was so messy on the floor. <laughs> and, every, and everyone's eating like, you know, hot dogs and like you just read all these and you sort of imagine like, the, how smelly and disgusting and people are drinking and hot dogs and glad you, know, you sort of get a picture in your mind but um it does help to have multiple sources when you only have one source on event, i think it's harder to reconstruct it that's, wow it's really interesting um uh tony since i've got you here i want to talk about humor because in the great and in the favorite it, it seems like you're able to mine what seems like historical details for jokes um, so you, do you kind of just like make assumptions like, oh, there's, there's a toilet in the middle of where the serfs live? Um, or do you, do you like read that somewhere? Like, do you find a diagram and you're like, oh, that would be a funny joke to have someone like taking a dump? Well, you know, how does that work? Um, a bit of both, I mean, we, a bit of both, I guess. I mean, I think they're always interesting. There was a scene in the favorite, which we ended up cutting that um, was so weird because I was like, it's so weird, we should put it in. And then we cut it for budget, but um, which was that the only person who could handle um, the queen, Olivia's character, her shit was 
um, Rachel Weiss. Like she was literally, she had all these names. She was Lady of Blah Blah and Lady, and her final name was Lady of the Stool. Right. And so she had to like stand there every time the Queen took shit. She had to go and stand there because she was the only one who was high enough to handle the royal shit. So anyway, we had to get it out in the end. But um, but it was so bizarre. It was so funny. Um, and certainly like a thing. So often there are things like that. You find the, you know, um, like contraception was a weird one where we found, you know, that they used to use the tops of lemons as a diaphragm. And so we were... So there were all these things that seem like we made it up and it's funny, but often they were true. Um, and I guess, I mean, I suppose as a writer, I, I like comedy. So I'm drawn to those kind of things that are details of character and um, they reveal character, they reveal the world, but they're also comic, you know, because both those, you know, the great and the favourite are, you know, sort of comic dramas, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, David, do you have anything to add about that? Like, like looking for, there's, there's definitely funny stuff in, in Mrs. America too. Is anything that you found like? Well, one of the, you know, when I started, before I started working on this, I, my image of second wave feminists were like humorless, you know, aggressive women who are unhappy. Cause that's how I think the right successfully portrayed them in the media. So what I really wanted to get across was these were really funny, sharp, witty women. These are not, you know, these are not humorless women. These are women who have real self-awareness and really make fun of themselves and laugh at themselves. Um, and I, I tried to be true to their brand of humor. So like Jill Ruckel's house, played by Liz Banks, like tend to tell corny jokes. So that's her thing. And like, you know, Gloria tend to be dry. That's her thing. Bella was just, is just really hilarious. Um, so just wanting to bring that in and not, not again, getting back to like, it, just because historical drama does not mean to be important and these women can be silly and playful, just like anyone. Right. And also I found like some of the things on the, on, in the anti side, like they really did bring bread and had signs that say from the bread makers to the breadwinners. And they did have those stupid jingles and they did make parody songs about feminists that they, <laughs> they put on like a whole show and like, you're in your writing room, you're like, I can't believe she actually like had a funeral for the Equal Rights Amendment and did a parody of Bella and Gloria. Like how, and it was just so funny to us that we have to do that. So you're right, in the research, you'll find these details you cannot believe and that just gems and they just wanna put them on your show. Amazing. Um, here's, here's another um, question from out there. Um, uh, do you feel obligated uh, to to talk to a real life subject's family if they're still alive? What kind of creative license do you have without running into legal issues? I feel like I should have my lawyer answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be like a, a general answer. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so what I was told by the legal department at FX is that when you talk to a living person about the story you're telling, you are beholden to their version of the story. Even if their version of the story is self-serving or not factually accurate. So we chose not, we didn't want to talk to anyone because we weren't telling, we weren't doing, a, if I was doing a biopic, for instance, of Gloria, I would want her blessing. I would want her to be a consultant because this is her biography. We're not doing a biography. We're telling a story that involves many women and they each have sometimes conflicting points of view. So we wanted to stick to the primary sources. I do, I do think you're obligated to tell their version. And you know, I would, I would challenge the notion that the person's version of what happened four years ago is the factual version. Right. All subjective. So. Totally. Um, uh, well, did you find yourself consulting um, when you're doing like archival research? Um, did you ever look at any oral histories? Um, like like people's yeah oh, yeah um, Phil, Phil Schlafly did an oral history with the Lincoln Library like oh, wow. in 2011 and a lot of the stuff came out of the, those interviews that she gave even stuff that some of the Schlafly children are disputing but I'm like it's right there in her interview uh, Gloria Steinem did an oral history there's an oral history of Ms. Magazine that we read so the oral histories are great I and love to love those yeah such a great resource. It's actually a better resource than some of these memoirs, to, to be honest, because it's very, it's just question, answer, and they're asking about very specific moments in history, and it's, it tends to paint a really clear picture, so totally. I highly recommend oral histories, and also 
Also documentaries from the time period. There are a lot of documentaries by female film filmmakers in the 70s that weren't wide, widely known that were really great and just seemed, like especially one called Year of the Woman about the Democratic 19th century convention. And you're like, oh, they really were on the floor in weird hats, you know, screaming about the male media pigs. But awesome to see. <laughs> um, so we got like five minutes. Um, this will be my second to, second to last question. This is another one um, from, uh, from everyone out there. Um, uh, do you have any tips for not using research or wait for, okay. Do you have any tips um, on not turning research into an excuse to procrastinate? <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's a great procrastination tool. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to write. That's the well, answer. It's a better procrastination than something that won't help you in your writing. So as, as procrastination goes, if it's that or eating straight out of that pint of ice cream, I feel like research at least may help you down the road. So it's yeah. like good procrastination. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so last week, I'll make this my final question just because I, I love writers' answers to this question. Um, last week I was moderating um, a talk about writing for theater and TV. I was talking to Katori Hall and Stephen Levinson, um, and and I mentioned that um, my favorite playwright is August Wilson, and I love how he talks about um, his influences. Like he's like, I love blues music, and I love Pittsburgh, and I, uh, you know, I love uh, Juan Luis Borges. I love, you know, like uh, he's he's influenced by a lot of things. So I want to ask ask you guys, um, just, just because I think it's such a great way to think about your own writing. If you, if you had a capsule and you could put like three things into it that are like your big writing influences, what would you put into that capsule? Wow. Switching total gears from, it's a really hard question and it's switching total gears from talking about research, but I just think it's, I think it's a really fun thing to end on. <laughs> mm. Um, hmm. I think my, my local barista, can he go in it? Because yeah. <laughs> um, that, like, my I parents for fucking me up and giving me breast <laughs> for the mill. <laughs> totally. As far as your other writers in the capsule, I would probably say Tom Stoppard, Nora Ephron, Wendy Wasserstein. But it's Actually, real. Mrs. It's America, and I don't, I don't know if this was like your intention, but Mrs. America, the beginning of it to me feels a lot like Wendy Wasserstein. Um, yeah, so there you go. There's your compliment. <laughs> I was in a Wendy Wasserstein play at college. Is it romantic? Which one? Which one? Is it romantic? Okay. I know this is hard to believe. I play the Jewish mother. <laughs> Such a stretch for me. <laughs> what about you, Tony? Um, what else? Uh, I'd probably put, I mean, I'm a big uh, poet, like weirdly enough, I'd probably put a lot of poetry in there, strangely enough. Um, and we, like, I, am I allowed more than one? You know, Bukowski oh, you know, poetry. I mean, I <laughs> but you're allowed as much as you want because yeah. it's so. I, I mean, I really, I like, I read poetry a lot because it's, I love rhythm. So I put, you know, there's this New Zealand poet called um, Lindsay Hira Bird, who's great. And I put Bukowski and Mary Oliver and, you know, like Raymond Carver, because I, you know, I read them all the time. So I put them in and I put my barista in and I put Larry Gelbart in and, um, Oh, who else? It makes a lot of sense, everything you just yeah. said. <laughs> I'm definitely relating to being in a capsule at this moment. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm, and that's, that's, that's like, my thing. <laughs> we're all in a capsule and, uh, you know, thinking about all the writing we're doing or not doing. <laughs> so. Don't feel bad if you're not getting a lot of writing done. That's my other tip. This is a tough tip. Oh, yeah, totally. No one's Don't getting expect to be productive. Yeah. <laughs> are you guys, are you guys... Oh, Davi, I just noticed you have a bunch of playbills behind you. That's oh cool. My God. These yeah. are my, my husband's grandparents collected playbills from every show. They live in New York and they That's sent them to us. And they're from like all the shows they've ever been to, which I wish I had kept playbills myself. But we wanted to That's put them on cool. display. 
It's the archivist. I'm trying to up my backdrop game now that we're on Zoom all the time. So I'm glad that it was. Right. Oh my God. I, I had to remove all the dirty laundry from my futon. I am going to get a chalkboard for my next one because Tony looks so good in front of the chalkboard. I kind of wish. Oh, I yeah. I love my chalkboard. So it just makes me, it, it, That's all I write on now. Just dates that they then rub out the next week and go, well, that's not going to work. Um, at the moment, it's just like, it's, sort of mo it's just mocking me now. I'm like, it's just, rub it out. It's embarrassing. This was so good, you guys. I mean, does anyone have any like final thoughts? Anything you want to leave us with? Or, I mean, I think we could, you know, we can call it, call it a, is it morning there, Tony? I guess we can call it a morning. Oh. Yeah, 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, that was fun. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much, Laura. That was a yeah. really fun conversation. Thank you, Tony. I love this. Nice to talk with you. Yeah, you too. Bye. Lovely to meet you.